بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Imagine you are going to a bookstore you are finding many books in the first row Sometimes you will feel you will feel that one title of the one book will grab your attention and will force people to take this book why because of the title just because of the title this is Fahad al Mdairi from STC welcoming all of you into this very interesting title which is the chat GBT. Again, when we hear about this, and when we discuss about this every day, and maybe most of the people are really using this, these days, I would say in this period, this of course, for all of us in STC, and plus the public, to know more, more about this topic. And before diving in, let me go through the guidelines of today's session. As usual, we will going to have uh, a Q&A session at the end of it. Uh, if you guys have any question, you can direct your questions in the chat box. Then we will, uh, inshallah, direct it to uh, our guest today. Plus, if you have, uh, if you want, let's say, to have the material, make sure, guys, you are signing in into this session by using your STC's uh, email. Uh, why? Because you are going to receive an email contains the material, which are considered to be two things, the presentation, PowerPoint, plus the video recording of the session. Lastly, in the guidelines, you will uh, receive a survey. Please feel free to spare a minute filling this survey in order to us to improve the next session to, uh, sessions towards enhancing the full program brought to you uh, by STC to all of you guys. And now uh, I will talk a little bit about our guest uh, today. Uh, he is a professor in uh, Prince uh, Sultan University. He is a professor in the computer science and research director. Uh, mashallah, even though he is an executive uh, director of Innovation Center, he is a full professor in the computer science and Prince Sultan University. Director of Researcher and Initiative Center, a senior researcher, a senior fellow, mashallah, tabarakallah. This is a really um, adding value, actually, to our program to have you, uh, Professor Unais. Today, I will hand over to you now to dive in into uh, this. Uh, hear me? Yes, now we hear you, yes. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a big pleasure to be part today of this talk and presenting one of the hottest topics nowadays in uh, technology, in artificial intelligence. This is like we are in the new era of artificial intelligence. It's not only the technology. Uh, there is a big transformation nowadays uh, with what we know as generative AI, and all has been triggered with the rise of ChatGPT. And today I'm going to give you a glance about ChatGPT. It's some teasing applications. And then I will try to guide you in a very simple manner to the technology, the, the, the reason behind the technology and how we came into all these uh, applications that we can see nowadays on generative AI. So let me first share my screen. And I'm going also to show you some of the demo for the work that we have been doing here at Prince Sultan University as application of ChatGPT and how it can uh, boost the performance and productivity. Personally, my personal productivity has increased by uh, to a large extent, you know, since the rise of ChatGPT, it's a matter of to know how you can use it effectively for uh, improving productivity and performance. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, as-salatu wassalamu ala nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Okay, so our talk today will be about uh, the hottest technology ever, which is ChatGPT, which is one of the instances of what we know as the large language models, namadaj al-lughawiyya al-kabira. So would you like me to talk more in Arabic or in English? I will try to uh, use the two languages, uh, probably sometimes to explain some of the technical, uh, some of the technical terms like large language models and uh, uh, which are used actually uh, based on a lot of data. They are constructed or built based on a lot of data and they have an impressive cognitive and reasoning skills. And this is why they have made the biggest impact now 
in our uh, in our work in our daily life and uh, different areas as well. So let me first start with an introduction of the robotics and Internet of Things lab. This is my second family. And uh, this is the first lab established in Prince Sultan University back in 2017. We originally started working on robotics, drones, Internet of Things. Now we have expanded a lot in artificial intelligence. We have been working a lot on uh, technologies like uh, computer vision surveillance application. We've developed uh, different type of platforms, uh, either using uh, computer vision uh, with deep learning, and also some of the application are based on uh, autonomous robots. Like you can see here, we have made we have developed a fleet management system that we have used in our warehouse automation. We've developed the complete system to control and monitor the robot over the cloud. Uh, it has been also used for uh, coffee delivery and also for document delivery. Uh, we have been also working extensively on uh, drones. And uh, here you can see uh, the fleet, another fleet management system, but for drones, which allows the user to make command using a mobile phone. And then this command will be sent to an operator. So let me just go a little bit forward. So the operator is going to find here the, the path between the two points, will make the validation, and then it will go to the authority, which will check the whole mission. And finally, once it's approved, we will have a, a fully autonomous mission made by the drone to uh, make the pickup from the source location and go to the destination for the delivery and getting back to the home location completely fully autonomous. And we have, uh, we, we were honored the last season of Al Hajj. The most of Al Hajj Al Madi, Alhamdulillah, Tasharrafna Bil Qiyam, Bi Nakal Dam Mabin. اثنين من المستشفيات في في ميناء كان ذلك خلال فترة الحج الماضي الحمد لله تم اختيارنا من وزارة الحج وزارة الصحة وأيضا سبل البريد السعودي لأنهم كانوا في خلال الديمو هذا هم كانوا زارونا وقمنا بالديمونستريشن أمامهم وقمنا بتطبيق الحمد لله بنجاح خلال فترة الحج هذا باختصار على الأعمال اللي قمنا بها طبعا الآن since the start of chat GPT we are very heavily working on large language models Alhamdulillah, we were the first to conduct a training on ChatGPT. Uh, it was in uh, May 2023, and now we are conducting our second training, uh, which will be starting on October 21, 21st, which has two specializations. One specialization, which is more about practical aspect, for example, how to use ChatGPT in increasing productivity or for research and education, for creating startups and business uh, for business professional, how to create a startup from A to Z, and also the life cycle and how you can fine tune LLMs. I'm going to provide some overview today. And the second specialization will be more about advanced concept about the technology itself, how to program, uh, how to program large language models using long chain, uh, what is tokenization, what is word embedding, what are transformers, which is the core technology of the LLM, and how to build a complete large language model from scratch. So this will be coming October until 16 of December, inshallah. This will be our second. And you can have uh, you can have more information in chatgpt.ratiolab.org using this QR code. OK, so let's get started now with the presentation. You know, the world is changing. You know, you know it's dramatically changing since the start of ChatGPT. Now it's become the human trap. Uh, it has tremendous performance that nobody actually was thinking that we will be at some point in time relying on most of our activities on just an AI machine. So AI has been there from a very long time. Uh, there is nothing new about deep learning. about. But back in 2017, with the use of transformers, things started to be more efficient, especially with the increase of uh, computing resources and also the amount of data. The scientists were able to build machines that are more and more intelligent. And just to give you an insight about how ChatGPT is unique in the impact it has made worldwide, you can look at how many days ChatGPT took just to reach 1 million users. It's only five days. If you compare to other biggest technology like Instagram, Spotify, Dropbox, Instagram, the closest, it took 2.5 months in order to reach 1 million users. ChatGPT is just in five days. That's tremendously impressive. And, you know, this is there is no... Surprise, because if you if you just work a few minutes with ChatGPT, you will be completely addicted because 
it provides a, a lot of different capabilities that no other AI model actually is providing. And still, until today, there is a lies of, I can say hundreds, if not thousands of large language models, but ChatGPT remains on the top. Although in some of the cases, some of the uh, open source models or emerging models, they mentioned that they can outperform GPT in some of the tasks. But considering the holistic scope of ChatGPT, the, the way that it can manage different type of tasks completely uh, that it hasn't seen before, makes it still number one in all the realms of large language models. And just to uh, going back to the March 2023 and uh, the early days of ChatGPT, it has made a lot of changes. Like, for example, uh, in the beginning, in 30 of March, Elon Musk said, uh, said that we need to have a strategy to reduce the expansion of uh, generative AI because it can represent a threat for humanity. Just one week after it opened its new rival company, which is the X company, which has replaced Twitter nowadays. Geoffrey Hinton has uh, actually resigned and quit Google to be able to criticize and uh, the, the emergence of, RTV, uh, of generative AI and the harm it may do for humanities. And also there is a big rivalry now between Google and OpenAI. Still Google is trying to catch up with OpenAI with their new language model, but still ChatGPT, especially ChatGPT4, is still making a big difference over all previous language models. But okay, let's, let's take it from a very uh, simple manner. What is generative AI engine? So as we can see this as a kind of a black box, of course, a black box that has to be trained on a large amount of data. And user will just provide a prompt, which can be a question, which can be an instruction, which can be just the beginning of a sentence. And this generative AI engine, this huge generative AI engine is trained to provide completions. And now the completion is not only text, but it can provide you a completion on images. For example, now there is mid journey, if you go, if you make an account on Mid Journey, you can write a prompt. I want, for example, to have a picture of a cat that is learning in a classroom. It will just make you something similar to your prompt, uh, whatever imagination you have. So we can see a generative AI, it's from human imagination to machine generation. You just need to imagine anything, and the machine will be able to generate some context that is relevant to your imagination. And this actually open horizon to many things. Okay, we can explore things or information or knowledge that we didn't have access before or that it will take us a longer time to get access to that information. Because now the previous way to look for the information is that we go to Google, we need to type our keyword, they will do a semantic search, you will have a lot of results and you need to browse the result on your own. Now this is different with generative AI. You ask a request, okay, or you search for something, it will provide you the accurate information without having to search for many documents because all these many documents were integrated into the training of this machine so it's able to memorize a huge amount of data and basically it tried to mimic the human brain in some of the ways and the machine is very good in memorizing and in computing very fast okay we as human occurs we have a memorization but probably okay it's different from we from one human to another but now the machine is able to memorize a huge amount. It, it's able to memorize the internet. I mean, if you ask in healthcare, it will respond. If you are in financial system, it will respond. If you request something in education to respond, it has a cross-disciplinary uh, cognition engine. And this is what makes it marvelous and really impressive. So let me take you first in some teasing uh, examples. I, I, I tried to make some examples related to SDC, although I know probably the audience is broader. And for example, this is a small uh, demonstration that tried to do on uh, emulating a product sale for STC. You know, we can actually run it. This is the program. It's here. OK, uh, I just typed this uh, prompt yesterday. So for example, I, I typed hi here. It, it responded to me. Thank you for reaching out to STC customer support. Of course, we have fine tuned the model to act as an STC customer support. So you can have a large language model and then you can fine tune it in the way that you want, for example, to make it for STC, for company Y, Z, or X, and then it can provide you customized service for that particular company. Now, for example, I want to buy a new mobile phone and I really like the iPhones. And here it will respond based on the knowledge that it has. Of course, I introduced some knowledge to the engine and it told me that uh, we have a current offer of iPhone 14 Pro, which is available at discount at this price, which is 30% discount sale, which is now the current offer actually of STC. And 
And the good thing here, we don't have a static text. We don't have, if you ask the question a different time, it will have another personalized and customized response. This is different to the traditional boring chatbots where you ask a question, it has only two or three possible answers. And sometimes it gives you completely a misleading answer. This is a, an intelligent, this is a smart engine that can interact with any situation. So I wrote this, for example, I want to purchase this before the offer ends. If anyone else will write something different, it will be able to react dynamically and effectively. So it can anticipate on any unseen scenario. You train it on some kind of amount of data, but if there is something unpredictable, it will be able to provide still reasonable responses. So another one, uh, okay, here I have emulated the discussion uh, related to internet connection you can read here. Okay, so I have a problem with my internet. Since yesterday, it, it tells you, okay, I apologize for the inconvenience. It, rep it replies politely, how can I help you? You can provide some more information about the connection, for example, some kind of disconnection or so on. It will tell you, for example, send me the details about your registered mobile number. You give some number and then it will continue interacting in a, in, in a very natural manner. And this is really impressive, uh, the, the amount of uh, responsiveness and the quality of responses provided. It's, uh, it's awesome. And in Princeton University, we did a similar thing. We, tomorrow, we are going to inaugurate our chat GPT for Princeton University community which we called PSU GPT. I'm going to show you a demonstration by the end. And uh, this is a complete software that we've developed based on 33,000 prompt and completion to fine tune the chat GPT model. And I can show you here a few information. It can understand any kind of language. You can query it in Arabic, in English, in French, in Spanish, and it will respond in English. For now, we can respond with the same language. It's still uh, something simple. For example, here, you ask a question, uh, I am your PSU assistant who is the president of the university. It can respond. It's Dr. Ahmad Yamani. And this is based on the knowledge that you have trained on. So if you ask in Arabic, it will be able also to respond. What's the minimum GPA? What are the conditions to drop a course? Now, we have evaluated the model. It's able to respond with 80% uh, accuracy. Uh, and the quality of uh, the responses is at 80% right now, which is actually excellent. So tomorrow we're going to start this officially. It will be inaugurated by the president in the opening ceremony here at Prince Sultan University. And now that's another thing that we can do, for example, with the customer service is the sentiment analysis. So STC, I think you should receive like probably thousands of feedback from the users. Some are happy, some are disappointed. And you want to analyze this. Yeah, analyzing this manually, it's tedious and uh, very difficult. Now we can use ChatGPT, you know, uh, you can send, for example, thank you for the new offer. I really enjoyed it. It's an excellent price. When you submit, for example, let's say it will submit this information and the user will receive immediately a response. Okay, look at the response here. The, here I put a completely positive feedback. So it say the sentiment is 100% positive and then look at the information provided. It's really awesome. It takes the context that is sent by the customer and it said, okay, thank you for taking time to provide us your valuable feedback. We're thrilled that you had a positive experience with our new iPhone Max Pro. We're glad to find this price and quality device excellent and all these different kinds of things. And let me show you just uh, another live demonstration. You know, this is something I presented here and I made uh, a comment that is, let's say uh, half, uh, okay, let's say 70% may be positive and some of the other commands that need improvement. Thank you for installing the new modem at uh, 200 GB. I appreciate the quality of your service. However, I feel like the coverage of the modem in the house is okay. Let's see, it's not good enough. I, I want to put something a little bit negative as it cannot reach some rooms. Anyway, the speed was great, thanks. I'm going to submit this right now. Okay, and just in a moment, it's submitted, it's now being processed. I need to receive uh, a feedback. Okay, now it's submitted. Thank you for the, your feedback. Now imagine that you have this kind of form for your customers. Just in a moment, I go to my email and I find the response. And it says that it's positive with 75%. I, I told you in advance, I will make it 70% of positive feedback and look, and it provides you something customized internet 200 uh, gb of modem 
We apologize for the inconvenience you've experienced. Look, and if you send any other context, it will accommodate. Isn't this impressive? I find it uh, very awesome. Okay, so let's move forward. And these are some example of applications. And later on, I'm going to show you uh, a real demo of our PSU GPT, uh, which we spent a couple of months to build the model. And of course, this is an iterative process. We always, when you build a model, it's not the end. You need to always keep adding data and improving the technology. Okay, so let's start from this black box. You know, we have an engine, which is a black box. We have a prompt, we have completion. But now I will try to give you some intuition how we can build this engine. Okay, what's the, what's the marvel inside the engine that can handle any kind of situation? I, I'll try to explain you. It, it's a difficult, it's a difficult uh, technical, uh, there are difficult technical details, but I'm going to present this in a very simple manner, in a very intuitive manner, because everything is, I try to mimic the human behavior and the human brain. So uh, things are intuitive. So first of all, let me introduce you the difference between a base model and what we call a fine-tuned model or an instruction-based model. So usually when we start to build a large language model, we are going to build something that is a base model. What is a base model? We have a black box and you are going just to inject a lot of text, a huge amount of text. There is no instruction. You know, you bring text from the internet, from Wikipedia, from, from any kind of sources. You just plug it into the machine. It will learn the sequence of words. What's the sequence? For example, if I have this sentence, what will be the next word? It's kind of word prediction, the next word prediction. It will learn how to predict the next word. These are probabilistic models. لأنه البيانات لما تكون كثيرة جدا تستطيع أنك تنتج بيانات تستطيع أنك تنتج نماذج إحصائية دقيقة اللي يكون البريدكشن فيها دقيق بكل بساطة وهذا نستعمله في كل ما هو ماشين لرنج أند ديب لرنج لما ننشئ النماذج اللغوية الكبيرة الآن ما عنده مهارات النماذج اللغوية هذه عبارة عن تعلمت لغة لكن ما عندهش مهارات مثل شخص مثلا تعلم لغة راح للابتعاد تعلم لغة سنة سنتين اللي لازم يتعلم مهارات علوم الحاسب لازم يدرس فنفس الشيء عبارة للتدريس نقوم بإنشاء بالفاين تيونينج يعني عبارة على تكييف النموذج اللغوي إلى الإجابة على أسئلة معينة فبذلك نعطيه أسئلة مع أجوبة بحيث أنه يتدرب على طريقة الإجابة على أسئلة في إطارات مختلفة هذا هو باختصار الفرق ما بين البيز لانجوج موديل والإنستراكشن موديلز طبعا البيز لارج لانجوج مودلز مثل ما بينت من قبل they are based on a large and labeled corpus okay there is a large and labeled corpus okay that we will use to train the model and this is usually very computation expensive I will give you okay for example llama model was trained on three trillion tokens and it cost around five million dollars to train it uh, so you can imagine we don't talk about the energy consumption we don't talk about the impact on the environment just to give you a number, OpenAI, uh, just the water consumption for OpenAI in one year, it's equivalent to 2,500 Olympic swimming pool. 2,500 مسبح أولمبي هو تقدير استخدام المياه للOpenAI to maintain ChatGPT. This is just one example. Okay, so you can imagine uh, the impact also on the environment, the impact of the cost. It's not everyone who is able to produce these kind of large language models. It's basically only giant industry. Okay, this is what we call base language, but actually providing these models, the human fine-tuned models, this is accessible. Now, even using OpenAI or Meta, you can provide your, your, your data and then you can fine-tune this model to be more specific to your uh, particular context. To your particular context. Okay, and now the surprising things is that when we train this model, we fine-tune them, those behind them ability. They have some ability to reason about the data. They have ability to, uh, to act even on unseen data. This is what we call the concept of few shot learning. It can be zero shot, one shot, or even few shot. So what does it mean? So this is an example of zero shot. What does it mean zero shot? It means I'm going, or this is an example of one shot. So here I give an example about a question 
and the way how to answer. For example, here, what is artificial intelligence? First of all, I want to have the definition, then I want to have the impact, and then I have to have an example. And then I ask another question, what is a bacteria in healthcare? Look, it's a completely different context. Now, the large language model has the ability to understand that I want a response similar to this one and will respond to the question using a definition, an impact, and an example. This one, this what we call it one-shot learning. It has learned how to respond just based on one example. It can, uh, okay, we can have also few shots. This is a more complicated example where we want to translate an action that is expressed as a human uh, uh, in human uh, verbs to a JSON format, which will be used by a robotic. Okay, so here we can give several examples on how to convert. Okay, for example, uh, this is the example. You uh, you will be given a human language prompt, and you need to return a JSON conformant to the ontology. This is the ontology, and here I give one example. Move forward for one meter at speed 0 0.5 meter per second. It re and you have to return this one. Now I am teaching the model how to respond to these prompts. Now, if I give another prompt, hey robot, go to the kitchen and bring some water, it will make me, okay, action is go to goal, the parameter location and the value is kitchen. And this is a new example, it hasn't seen it before, but it has learned from these few shots on how to respond to even unseen commands and instructions. There are many uh, actually uh, capabilities that are being investigated by scientists to improve the performance of large language models. And one of them, very popular, is the chain of thought. So what does it mean? So sometimes we can give an example. Okay, this is one, one short example, you know. I give a question and I give an answer here. But I don't explain how the answer is obtained. Okay, Roger has five tennis ball. He buys two more cans of tennis ball. He, uh, each can has three tennis ball. How many tennis ball does he have now? The answer is 11. I don't explain how. I don't explain what's the reasoning. And then when I ask another question, so the response was not correct. So scientists said, okay, now in this kind of situation where the large language model is not able to respond correctly, let me guide, let me guide it. Instead of giving just the response, I will give it how to solve the problem first, which is called the chain of thought. I'm going to tell the different step to read the solution. Okay, sorry. So here Roger started with five balls, two cans of three tennis balls each in six tennis balls, is six tennis balls. So here is how we calculate the answer. Now, when you give the same question, the model was able to infer the correct answer because it will mimic the same reasoning here. It's just from one example. It was able to learn how to solve the problem correctly. And this is surprising because this model don't even make any computation, don't even make any calculation. They are just text completion. You give a text, they will try to complete. This is the impressive part. And still the scientists are trying to understand why these models are able to understand. It's still an open question. We don't know exactly why these models are able to understand and to reason when they are built over a large uh, number of parameters and large amount of data. Okay. So now I'm going to take you now uh, through the, the training pipeline, okay? How we are able to achieve a large language model. So basically the training, it may go through four steps, okay? For the sake of uh, the most important steps are the first one and the second one, I'm going just to give a very brief overview about this one. But these two steps, the pre-training and supervised fine tuning, they are sufficient actually to give you some uh, good models to, uh, for a particular context. So uh, let's see the difference here. So for pre-training, this means we, we would like to develop a base model, okay? So remember a base model, we just put a lot of uh, data, okay? There is no instruction, it's just a lot of text and it will learn how to make completion in this text. So basically the data set is, is huge. We, we, we will take text of trillion of words. And usually it's low quality because, you know, when you have uh, millions of documents or billions of documents, you don't have time to read all of them and just uh, remove the noise and uh, keep the good quality data. So usually here we put any kind of data, you know, because at the end, statistically is going to converge to a good distribution. 
okay? When you have some noise into a large amount of data, this noise will be neutralized. This is the information. For supervised fine tuning, usually it's here by demonstration. We don't need trillions of words, but usually we use 10K to 1000K prompt and responses, okay? Which is usually low quality and high quantity as well. So as we go further, uh, for example, for training a reward model, this is when we want, for example, the model now is able to respond, but maybe it will respond with something harmful or something that is not helpful. So there are ways on how to retrain the model based on human feedback. So there will be humans evaluating the output from the supervised fine tuning. And if the output is bad, they will try to make some feedback to the model so that it will improve itself in the next iterations. Okay, let's take it very simple, you know, because the process could be a little bit more complicated. And now going to the algorithms. So usually here the, in the pre-training, we train the model to predict the next token or predict the next word. Okay, uh, I woke up in the morning and I, so I can complete, and I went to the school or I went to my office or I want to take a breakfast. So there are different ways of completion. Based on the initial context, the model will be able to predict what will be, what will be the next tokens or the next words. So this is what we call text completion, okay? In the supervised fine tuning, it also predicts the next token, but it's not based on raw data, but it's based on instructions, okay? Because we will train it on instruction, on questions and answers. So it will be able to be more interactive, more conversational. And this is how we build a chatbot. So these are not a chatbots. Supervised fine tuning models are basically can be used as chatbots. And look at the training now. Usually to train a pre-trained model, you need thousands of GPUs. I remember that GPT-3, it was trained on 100,000 GPUs, all of them A100. So it's, uh, it's something like, you need thousands of clusters to be able to train these kind of models. And it takes a couple of months, like GPT, Llama, and PAL, they were trained on thousands of GPUs. For supervised fine tuning, you can do this on one GPU to 100 GPU, depending on the how large is your data. Okay, so same thing also for the reward modeling and for the reinforcement learning. So let's go deeper now in training the base models. I'm going to give you just some flavor, some insights about the size of the data that is used to train some base models. Like this is a model that is called Bloomberg GPT. And this is like a chat GPT, but only applied for financial data. Okay. So it's a popular paper. It's uh, available here in Archive X. It's called the Bloomberg GPT, a large language model for finance. And these people actually trained the model on 363 billion token data set. And this is not like a, a very big model. I mean, now GPT uh, Lama model was trained on 3.5 trillion tokens. But look, the amount of data that is collected from different type of sources, okay? All these sources are financial sources, okay? And here, when they train their model, they, they mentioned that actually they, they made a combination between financial data and also uh, general data, because this will provide the, the model more ability to reason even in a broader manner, instead of being uh, confined to a very particular context. So this is one of the rules. If you want to train a very specific model, it will, al it will always help to use some kind of general data from Wikipedia or from the internet to augment the uh, to augment the model capabilities and reasoning because usually in context specific uh, the amount of data will not be very high okay so if you don't have a large amount of data this large language model will not converge very efficiently you need to have billions of tokens to be able to train these large language models okay now this is another uh, arabic large language models namudhaj lughawi kabir billugha arabiya tam insha'u fi jamaat Muhammad bin Zayd al Okay. And uh, this is one of the, uh, I mean, this is one of the fewest Arabic language, language models. There is another one also in the UAE, Nidam Noor, like and based on when, when I tried it, it was not very, uh, very efficient at the time. I don't know whether it has improved, but JS2 seems to be promising. 
it's still uh, so it, it's it's open for testing, but uh, you have to be waitlisted to have access to it. Okay, so it was trained on 395 billion tokens, and among them, it's only 100, uh, 116 billion in Arabic and 233 billion in English, and the rest is in code. And you can see here the amount of English is more, but still it was tailored for Arabic language, probably the amount of Arabic information. I'm not sure whether that would be the best way, but this is the choice of, uh, of the researchers. Uh, I would go for something with more Arabic weight, uh, but based on the evaluation that they made, it seems that it's providing at least one of the state-of-the-art Arabic language models so far. And this area is still very active. I mean, I think one of our duties is to develop these kind of Arabic language models, uh, very specific to the context, to the local context, uh, that is really very uh, interesting. And, you know, just collecting data is not sufficient before even starting to train, there is a huge amount of data pre-processing, okay? Because the data will come from the web, will come from translation, it can come from the code, so you can see the amount of pre-processing that you have to do, uh, like for example, removal of HTML on JavaScript, if you take it from websites, uh, citations that are not relevant, uh, Arabic text normalization, okay, replace some uh, non-wanted tokens. So this work usually takes a lot of months, you know, it's uh, the data collection and data cleaning is the most difficult part. And this is not only in large language models, it's in any kind of machine and deep learning. Uh, project. So once you have your data ready, okay, now the next step is actually to do word tokenization. You know, these deep learning models or large language models or machine learning models, they don't know what is a text. They only deal with numbers. So it's important to translate a text into a number. And the way that we do this is what we call tokenization. Okay, so a tokenizer it will cut the word into different parts, okay? So for example, here ground breaking, or let me show you here. So here the token is just a complete word. It has taken a look. Every word is a token by itself. But in some of the cases, you can find, for example, ground breaking. It can be divided in two words because ground is a word and breaking is a word. So especially when there is a word that will that can concatenate uh, from two words, it can be divided into different tokens. So this is the default token that is used by OpenAI. This is the way it has tokenized the different words. And finally, we need to convert these tokens and look at ChatGPT. ChatGPT was divided into chat, G as a token and PT as another token. That was, that is an example. And usually a token is approximately 75% of a word. Okay, because the word is one. Even in the Arabic Okay, so we take the word and see the word is one. Actually, these are different tokens just to approximate with the Arabic language. And there are different algorithms for tokenization like the BBE, the Unigram language model, the word piece, sentence piece, word piece, and so on. And then when we divide this integer, the token into integer, this represents the index of the token into the vocabulary. And when you build a large language model, you need to have a vocabulary. Let's make a vocabulary that contains all the possible words. Let's make a Okay, and the vocabulary size will depend also on the way how we do tokenization. Let me give you a simple example. Let's consider we tokenize a word by letters, character-based tokenizer. Okay, so a character-based tokenizer, each character is a token. So what will be your vocabulary size? It will be, I have 26 characters in English. So let's consider capital case and lower case. So I will have a vocabulary of 65 tokens. If you take a complete word, the vocabulary size will be very large. And this is why we divide the word into different sequences, into different tokens, so that we try to reduce. So there is a balance between the size of the vocabulary, okay, and the performance of the large language model. Because having a character-based tokenizer, it will impact the performance. I mean, the prediction will be much more harder. Okay, and finally, we need to define the, uh, to convert this token into vectors. And this is what we call word embedding. And there are several algorithms. 
فالان المدخل للنموذج الذكي الاصطناعي the input will be just a vector like this so this represent one word it will be just a number so of course there are different algorithms on how to convert word into embedding like word to vec globe and many other techniques and at the end we need to provide an input okay so a sentence will be just a sequence a matrix of vectors that's pretty much it and then the model is going to find the relation between these numbers okay we try to find a probabilistic distribution probability distribution okay by using all these numbers and when you have a huge amount of data you will be able to convert to a decent and good probability distribution that will capture the relation between words now the biggest invention so far in what we call a transformer this is what we call the attention or self-attention mechanism okay technically this is a bit complicated and it involves some matrix multiplication but let me provide you an intuition about what is an attention mechanism okay so basically attention they try to capture the relation between words let's look at this example okay we are going now to look at the relation between these words. طبعاً relation الآن we as a human we have learned over the past أن هناك علاقة بين الكلمات. This relation is something natural. We don't even think about it. الآن for example when I say قرأت خبراً يعني الخبر دائماً مقترن بالقراءة. فلذلك العلاقة مش تكون قوية نوعاً ما. ممكن نقول أن هناك علاقة 90% ما بين القراءة والخبر. لكن لو نشوف مثلا قرأت وجميلا العلاقة أضعف أوكي فنقول مثلا العلاقة هنا it's about 30% قرأت في maybe the, the relation is lower قرأت والجريدة أوكي قراءة والجريدة they have good relation maybe 50% so usually as human we have the ability to find to, to infer or to know the relation between words. مثلا هل يمكن نقول قرأت خبزا؟ doesn't make any sense. العلاقة صفر. فمثلا النموذج لما يتعلم ما راح يعمل خبز بعد قرأته مثلا. That's an example. ف this is the essence, this is the core idea about the attention. وطبعا ال probabilities هذا they will be try to find out during the training based on the huge amount of data and based on the attention mechanism simply based on matrix multiplications. What you see here is in green, this will be the input. This will be the word input. You look at these numbers, we will stack them together into matrices, but then there is some kind of magic of multiplying this. I'm not going to go into all these technical details, probably people from the deep learning can understand this, but, uh, and finally, the dot product is known in mathematics to find the relation between matrices. This is the least I can, say, I can say now. So we use the dot product ability to find the relation between the matrices, and this is what we call the self-attention head. Okay, we will have a lot of data. So one attention head is not sufficient. We're going to create multiple attention head. We will stack them all together. We will provide them our huge amount of data. And finally, we will add other, uh, also other modules like uh, normalization, feed forward, you know, these are, and we can build an encoder and decoder. These are the two type of architecture of transformer. And finally, these kind of models that are, that represent the core functionality of large language models. So this is the whole magic in a very simple manner, in a very intuitive manner. Taban, we're going to plug a huge amount of data, trillions of tokens, imagine trillions of tokens are being trained for a couple of months and they will converge to a probability distribution. That's impressive, okay? And finally, when you put any input here, based on the knowledge it is acquired in this encoder, or in this decoder, it will be able to provide you some kind of decent response. Okay, so, Large language models, it started actually since 2018, 2019, and this is right after the biggest paper now in AI, which is called Transformers is all you need.
There is a paper that is called Transform is All You Need, start in 2017, 2018. And look after that, people, Google start on work on T5, OpenAI work on, on GPT. Okay, there is the first version of GPT, and then Meta started to work on uh, the uh, OPT model, which is now known as the Lama model after, what, uh, after that. Plenty of models have emerged from 2019. So look, only for four years, and you have an explosion. And you know, even the evolution after 2022 is even bigger than all this number of uh, large language models in the past. And some of them are commercial, some of them are open source, like for example, most, if not all of the model by Meta Facebook are open source. The OpenAI model is commercial, and there are different types of business model uh, on how we can use this uh, product. And let me give you some intuition about the evolution of GPT series, which is the chat GPT right now. It started in 2019 GPT-1. It's only 100 million parameter. Okay, this is the number of parameters that, uh, that makes the transformer. Transformer, this one, based on the number of multi-attention head, the number of parameter will increase. Okay, so look now, started with 100 million, uh, then 355 million to 1.5 billion, and GPT-3 is 175 billion. And GPT-4, we don't know even how many billions parameters there are. It was not disclosed because OpenAI is like uh, becoming now closed AI for the competition that is being happening on large language models. They didn't disclose any of the technical information in the technical report of GPT-3. And here you can see the evolution since 2018, 2019, and, and so on. And basically, uh, GPT-1, GPT-2 are open source. Anyone can download, can fine tune, can train them from scratch, but GPT-3 is not, is not available. This is the evolution of the Llama from Meta Facebook. It was, uh, so the Llama introduction was in 2023, just a couple of months after the release of OpenAI, and now we have Llama 2. Okay, they have models from 7 billion parameter to 70 billion parameters. They are available for free, uh, either for education, for commercial. You can find them on Hugging Face. And uh, a lot of research have been around, even for their uh, for their adaptation to multimodal uh, generative AI. So, for example, the Lava model it uses Lama as a base for introducing vision. Okay, it's able to make uh, uh, image captioning, or even you can write a prompt, and then it can generate an image based on the prompt. Okay, so this is GPT-3 also uh, evolution, uh, and look at the difference between GPT-3 and Llama. So GPT-3 was has a vocabulary size of 50,000, and Llama it's low, uh, lower vocabulary size. Of course, this depends on the tokenization used, and uh, they have the same context length. Although now they went up to 16k uh, context length, and some of the models are reaching even 120k context length. The context length is the amount of text that you can put into the input. Okay. For example, in chat GPT, if you put text more than 1,000 or 1,000 it will say the context is too long. I think now in GPT-4, it can accept up to 4,000 tokens. And this is the number of parameters, 175 billion and 65 billion. And they say that the Lama is comparable to GPT-3, but honestly, GPT-3 and 4, they are still uh, much more advanced. And look now, when you train a base model, this is a completion model. So what does it mean, a completion model? Now, for example, I give this sentence, and manned aerial vehicles equipped with computer vision capabilities have been, and I stop here. And then this model is able to complete, have been used in a variety of civilian, commercial, and military applications. UAVs are capable of providing a range. It's... It's a text that makes a lot of sense. And you see now this, these colors, they represent the probability of the words that comes after. For example, if you see that here it's green, it means this word has high probability, military application. So in this context, application has high probability to come after military. For example, this word here, civilian, use it in a variety of, so civilian is not likely to happen. This is why in red, okay? So this represent the probabilities. It, it's not going to pick always the highest probability because this is like a greedy approach. It, it will lead only to a static uh, text generation. And there are different parameters on how you can manipulate the text generation in terms of creativity, okay? 
it requires like deep explanation. But just to tell you that this generation is probabilistic. If you generate 100 times, you will have 100 different type of generation. And base model are not assistant. Look now, for example, I ask this base model, write a Python script that creates a REST API. Okay, <laughs> it tried just to complete the, the sentence. It doesn't respond to my question because it was not trained for conversation. It was trained to complete text. It's not an assistant, it's not a chatbot. So what we will do in this case, okay, look now, but they can learn uh, to execute. So this one is an improved base model that was trained on some instructions and it's able to provide a little bit more decent responses, but still it's not what we want to have. And because this is this base model, our completion model, we need to train them on responding to instructions. For example, if I want a base model to write a code, I need to provide thousands of example of prompts to write code and with their responses to learn how to do that. And this is what we do now. For example, uh, text DaVinci 3, it's, uh, it was trained on instruction. So this is an instruction model, which is the parent of ChatGPT. And you can see it's providing a much decent response because this model was trained to provide this kind of answers. And this is what we call fine tuning. Okay, because base model are just completions. They don't know to execute instructions. And this is what we call here the supervised fine tuning. And to do that, we need to provide several prompt and responses. Okay, let me give you a simple example. Okay, for example, I want to train this base model to know the capitals of, to respond to the capitals of the different countries. I can provide hundreds of questions like this. What is the capital of France? It's Paris. What is the main city of Saudi Arabia? It's Riyadh. And imagine I can provide 100K questions and answers. So this base model is going to take this information, okay, put it again here, and it will update the weights so that it will be able to handle these kind of tasks in more efficient manner. And this is what we have done at PSU. We've created the PSU GPT. It's available at PSUGPT.ai. We've trained it on 33,000 question and answers all from the context of PSU. We've made a complete web scrapping of the PSU website, the different bylaws, either in Arabic, in English, took any kind of information. We converted the, uh, we converted this information into question and answers, which we call prompt and completion. And we trained them on DaVinci model and GPT 3.5 model. And then we have, this is a demonstration here. Let me show you. So this is the website. Uh, of uh, the model. Okay, and now let me show you a live demonstration. Okay, so for example, you can ask a question here. And who is the president? Of course, these are the questions I have in mind, but anyone can ask any questions about uh, Prince Sultan University. But look, now anyone will try. This is just, just a better version. Uh, every person can actually uh, provide a ranking to the answer, whether it is satisfactory or not satisfactory. For us, this is an iterative process. Whenever there is a, uh, an answer that requires to need to be improved, we will collect this information, make a new data set and retrain the model again and again. But for now we have 80%, more than 80% of accuracy on the response to the questions that are related to Prince Sultan University. Because now we've done a lot, but we don't know whether we are going to cover all kinds of questions. And this is why now with the release of this, we're going to collect more information, more questions from the from PSU community. And we do uh, additional training maybe every two weeks or every month to improve this model. And this is what ChatGPT is doing. If you remember, all language, language models are prone to hallucinations. It means they can give you completely false information. And ChatGPT and even Lama, they have been working on improving their model over time in order to reduce and mitigate the risk of providing harmful information or non-helpful information or hallucinations, uh, all of this can happen. Because, you know, as I already explained to you, these are probabilistic models. So they can write anything in a probabilistic manner if we don't uh, fine-tune them in a proper way. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, again, uh, if you want to read more about ChatGPT, I welcome you to join the Mastering ChatGPT uh, training, and you provide full details about uh, the topic I've talked about today. Thank you for watching, and I will be glad to address any question.
Shukran Jazeel and Professor. Thank you very, very, very much actually for delivering uh, this presentation and uh, this trending and very interesting uh, topic that we really live daily actually in this period. Um, let us jump actually to the questions now. Uh, we received many questions from the people and I will start by this question. The guy who asked the question here is somehow asking uh, what does actually chat what does make chat gpt unique when we talk about that all similar ai solutions have almost the same model and logarithm that used in the chat gpt so therefore what makes it real what makes it let's say unique well that's a good question uh, you know it's difficult to answer. We don't know what the secrets of OpenAI because the technology is known and there are other giants like Google, uh, my, uh, Meta, that are trying to do something similar. You know, the gap is, clo is, uh, is starting to be closed, but still, you know, ChatGPT 3 or even 4, the, and at least 4, you know, it, they outperform a lot uh, the, uh, the, other, the other models. You know, there are different reasons because now if the technology, when you train a transformer over the data, there are several parameters that you need to, what we call the hyperparameters, the number of layers, the number of parameters, how these parameters are internet co connected together, what are the different activation functions. You know, all of these, you know, they can play a, a big role and you cannot anticipate from the beginning, despite if you take all the different, uh, uh, the different precautions that you are going to have the best model ever. So these models are usually uh, subject to iterative improvement. But OpenAI, it has, for example, OpenAI, it has been trained on less tokens than uh, Meta, uh, and the performance is much better, probably because of the size. But now, for example, we can see some other, uh, some other models like BART, which is based on PALM2, which has a size of uh, 540 billion parameters, and still BART is not able to achieve the same performance of OpenAI at least even from language perspective, if they have comparable performance in terms of uh, English or Arabic, you know, OpenAI is decent, although it's not perfect, but other they may completely fail in dealing with Arabic language or other languages that were not trained with sufficient uh, information. The Arabic language was trained on ChatGPT only with 0.01% of data. And it, it, it's improving. I mean, uh, when I tried the Arabic ChatGPT in the beginning, it provided almost kind of uh, very weak responses, but now the quality of response is improving because as I already mentioned to you, it's an iterative process. So why these models are different? Why these people didn't reach OpenAI? It can be depending on the resources of deployment. It can be on the quality of data they have been trained on. For example, if you train on a huge amount of data, but this data has a lot of noise, this can also impact the quality. Maybe they need more iteration in order to reach. We don't know how much time OpenAI spent in the past before the release in order to reach this level and the other need to spend probably the same time to reach the same level of open AI. So it's only the time that will tell us whether we will have more competing models as compared to chat GPT. And I think the gap will be closing by the time. I think the gap will be uh, closing more by the time. Yes. Uh, before we go to the second question, I would say, mashallah, the questions are like rain. Yani, <laughs> I'm trying now to manipulate yes, you for an hour, no problem. <laughs> okay, the next question actually is talking about if we go from now in the upcoming five years, uh, do you expect ChatGPT to be improved or there will be some other model who will disrupt it? Yeah, it's difficult to anticipate. It's difficult because now things are moving from both sides, from OpenAI side, from Google side, from Meta side, other also emerging techno other emerging companies are also uh, taking this, you know, uh, university are investing as already in, in the UAE. They have made now two flagship uh, models. You know, the Falcon models, for example, that was released by uh, TII in the UAE, it has 180 billion parameters, which is even bigger than GPT. But still, okay, I didn't see like sufficient comparison between ChatGPT and uh, Falcon so far. But I think as already mentioned, 
in the next year or the next couple of months, the gap is closing. Now, if we go one year back when, when ChatGPT started, you know, there is not even a competitor. Now there are competitors, but probably not at the same level. But still, we have a lot of competitors and the performance is reducing. And in some of the very specific tasks, several new models are claiming that they can outperform GPT in particular tasks. But what makes ChatGPT, for, in my opinion, better, it has like a horizontal view of different type of uh, knowledges and tasks that it has been able to achieve. Uh, okay, Professor. Uh, in, you know, now we talked about, let's say, the terminology ChatGPT. Uh, the same context, what does chatbot mean, briefly, uh, if possible? Yeah, chatbot, you know, this is something known even from, from the past. It's just uh, uh, a computer machine that is able to interact with, uh, with customers or with people and provide response to the questions. But the way these things was done, it was based on classical machine learning and deep learning approaches. For example, uh, previous chatbots, we've made a chatbot for PSU before PSU GPT. It was based on a recurrent neural network, okay, which is like uh, the initial deep learning model for sequence to sequence, uh, sequence to sequence models. The quality, you know, is not always uh, excellent. Uh, especially, uh, and I think all of us, we have been interacting with chatbots, for example, uh, and from the first interaction, you, you tend to give up because you don't feel that this chatbot is actually addressing your question, but it has kind of a very specific type of question that it is trained on, is not able to improvise unknown situations and unexpected questions. This is not the case for ChatGPT and large language models. They are able to leverage the knowledge that they have gained about the specific context to provide you customized and dynamic responses even from unexpected situations. This is what makes the difference. Uh, okay, there is the next question is saying, do you agree or not that the benefit is all in the correct question of the program and the use of AI in order to obtain the correct knowledge and benefits? Absolutely. I think he's preparing. Yes. Absolutely. You know, this is a complete science now and complete new type of job that is called prompt engineering. Prompt engineering, يعني هندسة الاستنطاق. يعني كيف تستنطق الآلة لاستخراج المعلومات من عندها؟ احنا الآن لو نخليو 10 أشخاص أمام uh, chat GPT and we provide them a task to accomplish, probably not all of them will be able to accomplish in the same way because this will depend on their ability to ask correct questions and extract, uh, and, uh, and extract relevant information. Okay, because if you don't ask the question effectively and in a guided manner, you may end up, okay, you will have knowledge, but probably it's not the best way on how to uh, to respond to the question. So prompt engineering, now there are even new jobs in the US with very high salaries, which are called the prompt engineers. They will, for example, work in the marketing context or uh, healthcare context, or I don't know, just to be able to extract relevant information that is needed for the company to uh, improve its services. Um... And sh shall we allow the, you know, the usage of ChatGPT, say, in STC or not, especially when we need to address the security concerns uh, of it? You know, when you, buy, when you ban something, people will have tendency to use it even more. So I think uh, we should be aware about the risks and we should be uh, aware about how we can efficiently use it. So any technology will have a drawback, that's for sure. But it's difficult to ban the technology for uh, completely. Of course, now for sensitive information, now OpenAI, for example, they have launched uh, they have launched a new uh, new program that is called uh, ChatGPT for Enterprise, and they mentioned that now they are able to provide more security, safety, and privacy for companies who have concerns about this. Uh, I don't know to which extent, but it seems that they have different program uh, tailored for the companies and for the government. Maybe they can use ChatGPT locally on local servers or something like this. Uh, another way also to overcome the, 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 the issue of privacy is not to use ChatGPT or OpenAI, but you can use other large language models, like for example, the new ones from Falcon or uh, Meta Lama, Lama 2. Uh, these ones, you can use them on your premises, on your cloud. 
you can deploy them and customize them as per your need. But of course, you will go under a very heavy uh, setup and installation process, deployment process, maintenance process. So uh, using uh, a, a private or a public generative AI provider, this depends on uh, the company strategy and also the ability to run and operate these large language models because they will require a lot of maintenance. You know, as I already mentioned to you, OpenAI, they spend uh, millions or billions of dollars just to maintain and look at the amount of energy they consume because you require a cluster of GPUs. It's not only one or two or hundred, maybe you need thousands of GPUs to be able to run these models in efficient manner within your premises. Uh, professor, will all of this, will it reduce the communication uh, yani between the experts and the specialists? Uh, you know, if the speed in obtaining the answers and research through the program yani, decreases, this will affect yeah. somehow the communication? Yeah, unfortunately, I would say yes in the future, whatever we want or we don't want. I have a speech next month in, in a conference which is called uh, does human expertise have an expiry date? And I think if we continue like this, we will have an expiry date. If the generative AI is going to explore more our capabilities and uh, replace our tasks. But, you know, um, we can see it from the positive context. Uh, I always say that AI and generative AI are here to assist humans rather than replacing humans. And if it's going to take some, so, some of the jobs, it will open also some, some, some other jobs. So people who don't know AI, probably they need to know AI not to be replaced. Okay, like I mentioned to you now, there are new job opportunities in the US and I think probably in other countries, which is called prompt engineers. And because with the prompt, you can do marketing, you, do, you can do plenty of things. Now I'm using, for example, ChatGPT in many of my education and research activities, because instead of spending one month to complete a task, I can, I can spend it in one hour. So nobody is going to just stay in the legacy just because I don't want to use ChatGPT, you know. I can do many things uh, in a small amount of time if I use uh, AI technology rather if I just uh, use the traditional approach. So we need to cope with the technology. We need to see how this technology can be helpful for us. It's not only, of course, there are threats that we need to be aware of, but it's better to cope with the technology rather than try, try to refrain it or restrict it. It's still new. People still probably don't understand it well, but with the time, it will become a commodity. Now, I think we are more familiar with ChatGPT than uh, 12 months ago. Okay, 12 months ago, there is not even ChatGPT yet. Uh, yes, so there is a threat. There is a threat, I would say, because personally now, I don't need a lot of expertise that I used to ask from people because with ChatGPT, I can do many of the things that I asked people before to do them. Uh, if we talk about Prince Sultan University, uh, what are the major uh, difference between ChatGPT and the new developed uh, model for the university. Yeah, now if you ask ChatGPT about Princeton University, it's not going to give you any response. But if you ask our, our ChatGPT, it's going to provide you accurate responses about Princeton University itself. So the difference is that we take the engine, which is the base model or the instruct model, and we teach this model about our information. Okay, imagine that we have 33,000 question and answer only about Prince Sultan University. It will learn about it, okay? We provided responses about the research ecosystem, about the academic ecosystem, about the recruitment, about human resources, about, for example, courses, uh, people, key people at the university. Provide a lot of, you know, and it's, we don't ask the question only one time. We ask the question multiple times for it to learn, to memorize, and of course, uh, how many iterations that also matters as well. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about Google Bard, uh, we got the image to text uh, generation. This capability, when do you think OpenAI will come up with this, with this feature, let's say? Which, which feature? The image to text generation. Uh, it's already there. This is called image captioning. That's even old, you know, from 2015, 2013, there are some... Uh, you know, people use deep learning con uh, convolution neural network with uh, RNN to make image captioning, but now it becomes more sophisticated with transformers. Now we have even text for, for text to image. You can write a text. If you go, there is a there is a good website that is called Mid Journey. You just type a prompt, and uh, it will generate you an image. 
I think I have used some of the uh, some of the image generated by me during my presentation, and this is very common right now. Uh, also, OpenAI they have DAL2, which is also a prompt uh, a text to image uh, generation. There is also now uh, I have heard that the Chinese are making something text to PowerPoint generation. There will be text to video generation. I think in a couple of months, maybe you can generate a full movie just by prompting a history. You know, you can take, for example, a novel and convert it to a complete movie by uh, AI. That could be possible also in the future. This is what we call multimodal, multimodal large language models. It's only text to text, but it's text to anything or anything to anything. Um, there is one person who is saying, I would like to know the possibility to create my own AI such as ChatGPT using existing uh, AI. Yes, uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, there is some learning curve, you know. This is why uh, we've made the, uh, the ChatGPT uh, training. Actually, this is actually the last point. If you see in our program, the last point okay. is how to use it effectively, how, how, how to program your large language models, because you, you need to learn all things starting from prompt engineering, how you can use it, how to can make fine tuning, what is the life cycle, okay? What is a transformer, what is tokenization? There is plenty of information to know about them in order to go for developing your large language models. You can find on the internet some notebooks, you know, you can use them, but if you don't have the sufficient background, uh, there will be just more improvisation rather than doing a systematic work to provide something useful, okay? Uh, Chat GBT can be a threat to Google uh, search engine or other engines. What do you think about this? For sure, yes. I think Google search now has been much uh, uh, low I and mean, I used uh, less frequently uh, since the rise of Chat, uh, Chat GPT. You know, I personally probably don't go to Google maybe only one time a day instead of going maybe 100 times a day because most of the search information I need, I will look for Chat GPT because Chat GPT is going to give me the it's the, the essential information I need. I don't look, I don't need to look for multiple documents on Google in order to, uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to find the information I need. Another way also is to use Google, but Google probably it will provide you a lot of information and you need only very specific. The good thing you can copy paste the information as it is instead of reading like for one hour, paste it in chat GPT, ask questions about that context that will provide you the right response based on the context provided. So there are different ways on how you can chat GPT, either with Google or without Google, uh, depending on uh, your uh, interest. Um, what are the best AI libraries uh, available to use in GS coding? Or say JS coding, sorry. What is this? I don't know. Uh, if, if the guy, please, if, if you are, if the person who asked the question who can clarify, uh, we get these two minutes. Let me jump to other question uh, for now. Um, can, can you state for us some challenges of implementing uh, AI in business and how, how can we over this challenging? The most difficult uh, part of applying AI in business is to convince the decision maker. But actually is there is nothing more straightforward than applying AI to automate processes in any kind of business. Now, for example, in education, I, I implemented this. For example, now I can make auto grading of uh, assignments of exams very easily, uh, multiple copies in just maybe two or three minutes with sending customized feedback to the students. In healthcare, we can use it, for example, to write medical reports, to make better communication with the patient. In human resources, for example, I developed a prototype of human resources. You can ask a question about any employee. It can give you a complete report with analysis, with recommendation, with insights about uh, the performance of uh, this employee. In, um, in legal, in finance domain, there are large language models that helps you providing you better insights about uh, financial information. For example, if you want to take decision about the investment uh, in certain businesses, uh, in legal domain, it can help you, for example, to draft uh, a legal document, in much, review legal document. So in any kind of business, it's possible to use ChatGPT to automate the processes of that business and to reduce some of the clerical works, okay, that usually take time. And uh, because all the businesses would like to have 
quality output in a short amount of time. And this is where AI is excellent. It can do it in a very excellent manner. But if you don't trust AI 100%, trust it 90% and review the output of AI, okay, and see how, uh, if it is fine, you can take it. If it is not fine, it will be uh, shorter to modify it rather than doing the things from scratch. Uh, professor, uh, professor, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, actually, we are reaching the final minute, let's say seconds of our session today. And apologize for the people who are asking, mashallah, tabarakallah, yani the questions. But we are run out of time, actually, guys. I tried as much as I can to gather all the questions uh, in the same order I receive it. Uh, again, shukran jazeelan, uh, Professor Onais, ala wujudak ma'ana fi hadhi al uh, and thank you to all, all the people and uh, seeing you inshallah at the next uh, sessions in the Smart Talk program. Shukran jazeelan.